Then the Amplified Version here, John's Gospel, second chapter, 13 verse, and when the Pentecost of the Jews was approaching, so Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And there he found in the temple enclosure those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers sitting there also at their, at, uh, also, there also at their stands. And having made a lash or a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple enclosure. Uh, that's bold. Both the sheep and the oxen spilled and scattered the broker's money's money and upsetting and tossing around their trays, their stands. Then to those who sold the doves, he said, Take these things away out of here. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise, a marketplace, a sales shop. How many of you know the house of God? In the Old Testament, he said it should be a house of prayer, not a place for making money. Amen. It doesn't mean it's necessarily wrong to sell anything in the temple or in the, in the local church, but, you know, it's just not, that's not the purpose of the church. Amen. Things in the bookstore, for example, they have costs to them. We recoup that, but it's not a big profit sales thing. It's not a big, you know, how many of you know it's not, we're not here to make a deal. That's what all this was about. And his disciples remembered. Now, here's what I wanted to get to, verse 17. His disciples remembered that it is written in the Holy Scriptures, zeal, the fervor of love, for your house will eat me up. I will be consumed with jealousy for the honor of your house. Wow. Well, that's my text. I know you don't know why I'm, where I'm going with it, but that's my text. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, you know, this is an interesting scripture. We've read this in Matthew's account, Matthew 21. I don't remember the verse, but it talks about there where Jesus did this, and it says afterwards that the, the, the lame, it, they came to him in the temple, and uh, they were healed. So there were some things that after some things were driven out, the spirit of God, the move of the spirit of God was restored back. You understand, and so that's uh, what he's doing here. He's removing grievous things, things that grieved the the the, uh, the anointing, grieved the spirit of God, in order so that the miracles and the people's needs could be met. The miracles could happen. Amen. So, uh, but that's over there. Like I said in Matthew's account, where it talks about. They, uh, they came to him, and that's in Matthew 21, 12 through 14. After this was these were driven out, they came to him in the temple there, the blind and the sick, and they were healed. Thank God for healing. Thank God for the move of the Spirit. This is a church that wants and believes in and moves with the move of the Spirit. And so that just simply means that uh, there's things that we can't allow in our, in our fellowship, things that we can't allow to creep in that would uh, grieve the Spirit of God. And uh, leadership, really, to be honest with you, has responsibility that, uh, to take the oversight. In fact, let's go back to the book of Acts, and let's notice a couple of verses, the 20th chapter, Acts chapter number 20. We're going to talk about the local church this morning, and we're going to look at uh, protecting the local church and uh, not allowing things in our local church that grieve the Spirit of God. Amen. So here in Acts chapter number 20, look at verse number 28. It says that take heed there. Talking, Paul is talking to uh, the pastors that he had called a pastor's conference, and this is how he ended with them. He said, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now notice he said pastors have been made by the Holy Ghost to be overseers. In other words, they're to watch over the local church. 1 Peter chapter number 5, overseers. I want you to say that out loud, overseers. Pastors are, they see over or watch over a local church. What are they watching for? Well, some of the things which, uh, which he went on to say. Uh, he said that there would be grievous wolves try to enter in there and to, uh, 
you know, divide and then devour the flock. And he said, also up among your own selves, some would rise up, talking about people coming in with wrong doctrines and so forth. And pastors are called to protect the local church from those kinds of things getting in. Have you noticed we don't just invite anybody to come in and preach here and teach here? <clears throat> we, we guard uh, what is being preached here. So 1 Peter chapter number 5, look at verse number 1. The elders, and those are the pastors, if you look at the whole context of the New Testament, which are among you, I exhort, who, also, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint. Then he said, not, uh, by, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre. In other words, not for the purpose of money, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples, or we say examples, to the flock. When the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that shall, fade, that shall not fade away. So he's talking about chief, Jesus as the chief shepherd, and he's calling what these under-shepherds, these pastors over local churches, he's calling them under-shepherds, you might say. Jesus is the church. He's the chief shepherd over all the church, the whole body of Christ. But he sets, local, he sets pastors in local churches, and they are accountable that to him, the chief shepherd. And so that's why he said there's certain kind of leadership there to provide. They're not to be a dictator. You know, you know, notice he said there, uh, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly. In other words, do this willingly, not for filthy lucre. In other words, he's talking, he's talking about addressing heart motives here. Not for money, in other words, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. So there's a certain kind of leadership that he instructs pastors to lead by. In other words, it's not like a dictator kind of leadership. Not as being lords over God's heritage, meaning, you know, not like the big, you know, the big boss of everybody's lives and telling everybody what to do. Yeah, that's right. Amen. And so um, there's, there's more than we have time to get into in this. But the point I'm making here is that just this one point here, he did mention, verse 2, taking the oversight thereof. So a pastor is responsible to take the oversight thereof, take the oversight over the church. In other words, he's not to boss people around individually, but he is in charge of what happens in that local church. What people do in their individual lives is not his business. You know, that's their choice. Amen. But he is, the pastor is to watch over what gets into a local church. Amen. And guard the fellowship of the local church. So we're going to look a little bit at that today. I want you to notice in Acts 20, 28, which we just looked at, he said uh, uh, that, he's been, that the Holy Ghost has made pastors overseers. And then in 1 Peter, he says to take the oversight. It's one thing to be made an overseer. It's another thing to take the oversight. Uh, in modern-day churches today, God has set pastors over churches, but there's this, this, this uh, trend happening in the body of Christ. The Holy Ghost has made them overseers, but they're not taking the oversight. And things are getting in. Wrong spirits are allowed to fellowship in the congregation. Things that are not clean and not holy. And people want a fellowship, and they want to be in fellowship with the local church, with people in the local church, and they don't want to live right. Now, I'm not necessarily talking about baby Christians. I'm not necessarily talking about people who stumble and get back up. Thank God we, we've all stumbled, and thank God we've all been able to get back up, clean ourselves off, repent, and get it right. Amen. I'm not talking about that. Tell your neighbor he's not talking about that. But what is he talking about? What is the pastor talking about? Huh? What is he talking about? I'm talking about people who know better but don't want to live right. I'm talking about people who are living in defiance of the Scriptures. Amen. Regarding sexual purity and things of that nature. They know better. And they, they just don't want to live that way anymore, but they want to keep coming to church. 
generally speaking, these kind of people don't hang around very long. They get convicted, you know. And they don't hang around very long, and sometimes that happens. But um, if they do want to hang around and keep the fellowship of the church, and they don't want to live right, they don't want to live pure, now, I'm not talking about just stumbling and saying, Lord, forgive me. I hate, my, I hate that. I hate that. I don't like to do that. Lord, forgive me. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about that. How many of you know we've all been there? Not talking about that. Look at your neighbor and say, he's not talking about that. How many of you know now what I am talking about? I'm talking about people, they just don't care. They just want to live the way they want to live. And then they want to bring that spirit into this church, and they want to have fellowship here. I don't want to live right. Well, the Bible says the pastor is to take the oversight. Amen. Amen. There's some things that, um, there's some things about a local church that I want to look at this morning that uh, I believe it's important that we understand about a local church. Number one, a local church is a fellowship. Go with me if you brought your Bible. I know you're probably uh, looking at it, but go with me to 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. Let's, let's look at uh, what we are as a local church. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. Let's notice verse number 20. He said here, But I say the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils. Now, if you look at this whole context, he's talking about uh, 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 not, he, he, he's talking about, well, just to save some time, he's talking about verse number 16, the blessing, the cup of blessing which we bless is not, is not the communion of the blood of Christ. He's talking about the communion cup. He's saying that's the communion of the blood of Christ. And the word communion is translated also in the New Testament fellowship. So whenever we take of the blood and have communion, we're fellowshipping with Jesus. We're fellowshipping with what that blood did for us. We're fellowshipping with the blood. And we're, we're saying we are in agreement with the blood. We receive the cleansing of the blood. We live holy like the blood. Amen. And we're going to stay in fellowship with the blood. We're not going to violate the cleansing of the blood. And uh, we're a body of people when we get together and receive communion. We're a body of people that have been cleansed by the blood and choose to live as clean as the blood because we want to keep the fellowship of the blood. Amen. We did a lot of teaching on the blood over this last, the end of last year. And so that's what the context is here. And then he said, uh, and, and he said uh, you know, we're not to have fellowship here with devils. Look at verse 20 again. The things which Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. You cannot drink of the cup of the Lord, talking about that cup of fellowship of the blood, and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. Amen. Then he said, do we, partake, or do, do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? And so what he's talking about is coming in and fellowshipping with the blood, partaking of the, of the holy presence of God that, that comes into our presence whenever we come together as a holy temple. And uh, then going out and fellowshipping with demons. He's saying basically that you can't do though, that, both of those. I said, I said, he said you can't do both of those. How many of you know the, the Lord demands to be alone in fellowship? Yeah. Amen. 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 Now, I, I want to say it again, just so we want, don't under, misunderstand, that we're not talking about any of us that just fallen and repented and got back up. I'm really not even talking about baby Christians. I'm talking about people that know, know they've grown up, they know better, and they just don't want to live it. That, that they don't want to live right. They want to come in and fellowship with all of us. Well, he's saying you can't do that. Isn't that what he said? You cannot partake or drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Down in verse 21. Then you cannot partake of the Lord's table and, and the uh, table of devils. Are you going to provoke the Lord to jealousy? And so if you read over there in the, uh, uh, this is in the first chapter of Corinthians, I mean the first book of Corinthians, if you go to the second book of Corinthians and you go to the 11th chapter in verse number 1, he said, uh, Would God you'd bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy. Remember, he said back there, Will you provoke the Lord to jealousy? I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband. 
talking about Jesus, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Amen. We're married to Jesus. That's what we are as believers. We were born of the Spirit of God. We have come into the family of God. We came into fellowship with the Lord and communion with the Lord. We're married to Him. We're one with Him. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. And a local church is a body of believers who come together saying, Yes, I'm of the Spirit of God. I want to live for God. I want to live clean. I want, I'm in agreement. I'm in unity with holiness, living together with other believers who want to live holy. That's what a local church is. Amen. Now, that doesn't mean none of us have ever missed it. Amen. Since I've been pastoring here, I don't know how many years now, 17 years or whatever it is, uh, I believe, and, and uh, I've missed it in that 17 years. But I, got, I, got, I, mess, I, I messed up, but I got the blood of Jesus on me, cleaned myself up, said, no, I don't want to live that way. I want to I live right. I want my attitude to be right. I want to live clean. I want my, I want my love walk right. I, want, I, want to walk in un, I don't want to walk in unforgiveness towards people and, and so forth and so on. Anybody else in the last 17 years or so, however long you've been a part of this church, missed it anywhere? <laughs> sure, we all have. So if what I'm talking about applies to anyone who's ever missed it, then we all need to quit and go home. But that's not what we're talking about. Thank God. Thank God we don't have to leave and close the church down. <laughs> well, we can't come together anymore. We've all sinned. Sure, yeah, welcome to the body of Christ. But thank God for the blood of Jesus. We, see, we don't want to live that way. We've chosen we don't want to live that way. Aren't you glad that if we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin, cleanse us from all unrighteousness? Amen. But see, like Samson, you can't fellowship with devils in the uh, uh, Saturday night and come in here on Sunday morning and st still have the power of God. Amen. Well, that's, that's uh, something, that's a side of the word we don't hear too much about nowadays. But anyway, so he said here in 2 Corinthians 11, I have espoused you to one, uh, to one husband. You're a chaste virgin presented to Christ. Hallelujah. Well, see, that's what he meant back here in 1 Corinthians then whenever he said in chapter, uh, chapter 10, verse number 22, do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? The Lord demands to be alone in fellowship. Amen. He will not fellowship with other spirits. Amen. And if we want to be in fellowship with other spirits, He demands to be alone in fellowship, so He'll back away. I didn't say a person's not saved. I didn't say that. I'm talking about fellowship. You realize there's a difference between relationship with Jesus and fellowship with Him. Tell your neighbor, I understand that. That's not hard to understand. Amen. And so He demands to be alone in fellowship. The Bible talks about Him in the Old Testament. He said, I'm a jealous God. Well, that's New Testament too. We just read it. He's jealous. In other words, it's like a wife or a husband that wants to, you know, stay in good fellowship with their spouse, but then they want to go out on dates with somebody else over a candlelit dinner and stay late in the evening at their house. Just something about that doesn't work with the, with the, with the spouse. Isn't that right? I mean, how many of you, if somebody wants to do that and they want to come home then and get back in bed with you, that there's something not going to work? Huh? See, that brings it home, doesn't it? That brings it home. Now, no, they're not going to just crawl in. They're, you're going to have a talk or, or a frying pan or something. You're going to have something to say. Just act, come in here and act like everything's okay between us. Everything's not okay between us. Amen. Amen. Somebody said, well, my husband's a jealous husband. Well, there's a, limit. there's a limit to how far that should go, but there is a place for that. Now, there's some people that I've, I've known men so jealous, they wouldn't even, you know, we were in church, they grab hands with your neighbor, and let's all agree in prayer. And so they, they grabbed hands with somebody of the opposite sex, and her husband got jealous over that. Well, that's too far. I said, that's too far. Amen. But, but, but there is a right place. 
for, for being jealous, you know. So do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Well, you can. The Lord can say, now, I'm not going to fellowship with that. Just like a spouse comes home, wants to fellowship with you whenever they've been out carousing around. You, you'll say, no, I'm not going to fellowship with you. You go get a hotel room. You want to sleep somewhere, sleep somewhere else. Isn't that right? No intimacy here. It's ruined. Aren't you glad that that can be made right through, through repentance and forgiveness and, and living right and proving ourselves and, and so forth and walking in love? It can be, but it's not automatic just because somebody keeps saying, forgive me, forgive me, but then keeps on doing it. Amen. That's what I'm talking about. Somebody that just wants to come to church, forgive me, forgive me, but then just going out and do it. They don't have any intention on living right. That's what I'm talking about. So I think you can understand the difference, can't you? So a local church is a fellowship. That fellowship is with each other. You know, we understand it's fellowship with each other. But really the fellowship that we have is with the Spirit of God, with God Himself. Amen. And that, that fellowship is to be protected. In other words, things can get into a local church to where that, uh, that, uh, that grieves the Spirit of God and He won't move in a church anymore. It can happen. Things can get in if it's allowed in by leadership. Am I making any sense? And so the leadership there is to protect that from getting in the congregation. Today, there are people that want to live in open homosexual relationships, and they still want to come to church. And pastors let that in their church. Except when one gets in, then more get in and more get in, and the church fills up with homosexual spirits. Amen. Well, we got we, they got to go to church somewhere because... You know, I mean, they need church. They need to go to church, so they got to go to church somewhere. That's the pastor's rationale. But Paul didn't seem to think that way. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 5, go over there. There was this man who wanted to live in sin with his mother-in-law. And uh, just nobody, you know, just live in open sin. Nobody doing anything about it. And Paul said it's reported commonly in verse 1, 1 Corinthians 5, 1, that there's uh, fornication among you, not so, uh, not so much as is named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that had done this deed might be, underline this, taken away from among you. For verily I, absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already that though I were present uh, concerning him that hath done, so, so done this deed, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you have gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Your glorying is not good. Isn't that right? In other words, they're not doing anything about it. That's not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Purge out therefore the old leaven. Underline that. Now you've got an underline up in verse number 2, taken away from among you. Now you've got an underline on, under verse number 6. Uh, verse 7, purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast of, uh, of uh, keep the feast not with old leaven. Now, leaven here is a type of sin. He's saying you are a, 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 a body of believers. Uh, and he said whenever sin gets in, you know, if you put leaven in a, in a loaf of bread, you put it in the oven, it'll spread through that, and it'll, it'll make the whole thing rise. And he's saying when sin gets into a congregation and it's not dealt with, somebody wants to just live in sin and it's not dealt with, he said that's going to spread. That's going to spread. And so he said, per, verse 7, purge that old leaven out. Get that sin out of there so that doesn't spread. You know, the, this city in, in, in Corinth, if you read Paul's writings to Corinth, Paul, I mean, uh, Corinth was Paul's troubled church. I mean, all kinds of stuff he had to deal with at that church. You read through it, you think, my goodness, a bunch of carnal. <laughs> Amen. It was his troubled church. He had a lot to deal with at that church, but he dealt with it. Paul didn't just kind of, you know, push it away and act like it wasn't there. He dealt with it. And so uh, what, what is happening in Corinth is, was a very licentious city. 
It was a very perverted city. You know, cities get different things on them. We got cities here in the United States that have different things on them. Some cities are known for homosexuality. Some things are known, cities are known for murder. Some things are known for different things. Some cities, some, cities, some places. And that's because there are spirits that are uh, dominating that city in that area. And what we see from this passage here, city, uh, the city of Corinth, you can study history and find that out. Even Bible scholars will talk about it. But city, uh, Corinth was a very licentious city, very loose moral city morally, very, very perverted. Uh, I mean, when he talks about, you know, not eating meat sacrificed to idols, those, those temple worship ceremonies where that meat was offered to idols, those were, well, we got kids in here, where they were perverted sexual ceremonies. They were not just, and we got stuff like that. We got stuff like that going on in politics today. Yes, we do. I saw it in the Spirit. The Lord showed me. I saw it. So, uh, but anyway, in, in cities, whatever is uh, strong in a city will try to get in a church. Satan, if he can't get in another way, he'll try to get in this way. I said if he can't get in another way, he'll try to get in this way. And uh, it's got to be, somebody has to be uh, oversee that church to make sure that that stuff doesn't get in the church in order to keep the power of God from being shut down and the, and the uh, sanctuary be no longer holy. You understand? Amen. And so Paul here is addressing this, and he didn't say, well, they got to go to church somewhere. He said, no, purge that out. Purge that out. Go down to verse number 8. Therefore, let us keep the, feast of, uh, keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. Notice he said old leaven. That's, that, that's talking about our old lifestyle, old sin, sin lifestyle. He said, uh, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Underline that, don't company. Not company with fornicators. Not to company with fornicators. That's something else you ought to underline. We've got three things underlined now. Not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters. For then must you needs go out of the world. In other words, he said, he's saying, look, you, I'm not talking about you can't be around uh, sinners, because, I mean, you'd have to leave the world then. But then he went on to say, uh, then you must leave the world. Verse 11, But now I have written unto you not to keep company. Underline that, not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such a one know not to eat. That's, that's another, underline that, know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them that are without? Talking about the world. Do not ye judge them that are within. In other words, within the church. But them that are without, God judges. Therefore, put away from among you yourselves that wicked person. Now underline that. Put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So we've got Paul talking here. He didn't say here, well, they got a fellowship somewhere. They need to get the word somewhere. He didn't seem to have that idea. Did he? Amen. He seemed to say, no, no, no. In fact, he didn't seem to say. He said it. Don't let that in there. He said, that's got to be dealt with. You've got to get that person out of your congregation. Amen. Well, that's what the Word says. And that's why Ephesians 6, 5, or Ephesians 6, excuse me, Ephesians 5, 6 through 11 talks about not to have any fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Amen. You know, the people you hang around will affect you. Proverbs 13, 20 says, walk with wise men and you'll be wise. People you hang around affect you. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, evil communications corrupt good manners. That means bad fellowship. Fellowship with the wrong people will, will uh, some translations say, it will uh, corrupt your character. That's, that's what some people, they, they I don't know why I keep falling, I keep falling. It's the people you hang around. Amen. You go back to Deuteronomy 1, 28, Deuteronomy 28, verse number 8, and you'll find God said, Who's here is afraid? 
before they went to the army and uh, before they went to out, out, took the army out to battle and uh, they said, okay, yeah, I'm afraid. Okay, y'all stay home. And they told the reason why. They said, lest your, your fear make somebody else's heart afraid. So what he's saying is spiritual things are contagious. I think you can see that from all these scriptures. Spiritual things are contagious. <clears throat> Amen. Faith, fear, wisdom, you know, good things, bad things, you know, offense, wisdom, uh, lust, critical spirit. All these things are contagious. We hang around people with these things, and that, that starts influencing us. And we start having fellowship with what they are fellowshipping with. Am I preaching all right? And we read 1 Corinthians 10 there said, uh, uh, you know, would not, he said, that you have fellowship with de devils, I would not ye be partakers of, of devils. So notice he said, what we fellowship with, we partake of. What we fellowship or what we allow in the fellowship, we start partaking of. So it's important what we fellowship with. Young people, amen, and that's anybody 35 or younger, <laughs> amen. I know you're all of that in a bag of potato chips, but, but not quite yet. Um, but, but, but see, it's important who you fellowship with. Absolutely important. I didn't say you couldn't, I didn't say you couldn't be around people because you'd have to leave the world and not be around anybody that's a sinner. It's not what fellowship is. Fellowship is a, is a sharing together, mutually sharing back and forth. They share, and you, and you share your heart, and whenever, whenever they share their heart, you open your heart to what they believe, what they say, what they think, what spirit they're in fellowship with, what they think is funny, what they think's not funny. You know, whenever somebody tells a dirty joke and you go, ah, <laughs> you just fellowship with, with what pu pushes dirty jokes. You just took that in, thought that was funny. Amen. Well, see, that's what he's talking about. He's not talking about you can't be around sinners at all. There's something wrong with a church that tells people not to be around sinners. Because we are the salt of the earth, and we've got to reach them for Jesus. How are you going to reach them if you're never around them? Besides that, while you're at work and you're, you're talking at the water cooler at lunch break, maybe they're not always talking about bad things at, at the time, you understand. And so you might have a little bit of talk there and so forth and be able to share just a little bit with them, depending on how open they are to the things of God. But what I'm talking about is, I mean, just taking, opening up your heart to them, letting them speak anything they want to in your heart, and you agreeing with it and vice versa. You really can't have, the Bible said in Amos 3.3, 3, you can't walk together with somebody unless you're agreed. You can only have fellowship to the level that you agree with somebody. And some people, that goes about this far. You know, isn't it great weather? Yep, weather's great. How are the kids? Oh, they're great. That's about as far as you can go with some folks. Because they have such fellowship with wrong spirits. Amen. I have watched, I've watched a, uh, uh, I don't know what to call it, a tragedy, really. It's a, it's a tragedy. So moms who stay with husbands who are fellowshipping with wrong spirits. And, they, they're, and they're afraid to leave. Now, I'm talking about when I say wrong spirits, it could be anything from immorality. It could be just, just rages, keeping the family afraid by the rages they go into and the unrepentance for the rages and uh, moms who will stay in that home keep those children in that home and grow up and those children grow up with that in their home and I guess it's fear of being alone or I can't I don't know what I'll do if I'm not you know under my husband because how am I going to make enough money to take care of the kids that's probably fear and that's a strong motivator. I'm not, I'm not saying that's no little deal. But I've tried to encourage some of them. Those children are passengers in your home. And right now, they seem to be doing okay. 
But you let them get 18, you let them get to the age where they can start making some choices on their own, and you, you lost them because you didn't deal with that at a young age. In other words, say to him, now, you're going to have to decide whether you're going to keep fellowshipping with that because I'm not going to keep fellowshipping with that. If you want a fellowship with that spirit that makes you fly into a rage, break up furniture, and make the kids all scatter into their bedrooms, well, then you can do that somewhere else. But I'm not exposing the children to this. See, I've watched children grow up in those kinds of homes, and when they get to a certain age, you lose them every time. Somebody said, oh, we need to pray. No, mom and dad's going to have to give an account for that, including mom who didn't deal with it and let the children be raised in that. Somebody said, you're hard this morning. I'm on rescue missions this morning. I'm on rescue missions this morning. Amen. So praise God for the Word that warns us ahead of time that if we hang around that, it's going to get on us. People wonder why they're oppressed. It's because you won't leave that big meanie. Come in this service all the time, no joy. We've tried to rescue some for a long time, but now their children are growing up. Boom, I'm out of here. Going out into the world, going out into sin, laying around with boys. And the parents are crying about it, wondering why. I'm not surprised at all. I tried to warn them years ago. You know, when you've been here for 17 years, that's a long time to watch somebody grow up. And you can watch them grow up from little wee tykes, you know, and you can predict. Brother Higgins said, I can predict how, how the children will turn out in families. He said, not because of revelation gifts. He said, I have revelation gifts sometimes, but he said, not just because of that. He said, I can predict based on how much of the light of God's Word the parents walk in. I can predict how the children are going to turn out. Now listen, if before you had light on some of these things, you made some mistakes, thank God for the blood of Jesus. But, but bite me once, dog's fault. Bite you twice, your fault. Amen. So we're not talking about the past that we didn't understand and we got under the blood. Thank God for the past and for the blood. I mean, the blood that covers the past is what I'm talking about. Amen. Amen. See, these things work in positive directions and in negative directions. You know, Peter, James, and John stayed the closest to Jesus, and they got the most impartation from Jesus. Elijah stayed real, Elisha, excuse me, stayed real close to Elisha, and he got more than all the rest of the sons of the prophets in the school of prophets. Isn't that right? Joshua got real, the most from Moses. He stayed the closest to Moses. But it works in the negative direction. Amen? There are situations you cannot maintain fellowship with people. Amen? And that's true in a local church. Because you'll get impartations from them in the evil direction. Amen. People are confused about these things because they've heard the message of the love of God. And true, that message is the true message of the Word of God, isn't it? But they think, well, you know, what he's preaching, that's not the love of God. Well, it's the love of God for a congregation. who want to come, to want, want a place, the only place in the city all week, that they can come and not have the wrong influences influencing people and where somebody's demonized, fellowshipping with something else all week, perverted. Amen. Well, you know, it's not too bad. I mean, I can go to the mall. I was in the mall just the other day, and I looked up, and there's two boys walking down the mall holding hands. I just about puked. You say, you don't love them. Oh, I love them. But see, a lot of people uh, don't know what love is. They wouldn't recognize love if it's walked up and smacked them on the side of the face. So people are confused about what I'm preaching. They say, well, that's not love. They've heard the teaching on the love of God. And uh, they think that love means you tolerate evil. Well, there's places that you and I don't have authority to do anything about it. I didn't have any authority to do anything about that in the mall. And you're foolish if you try to do something about it in the mall. You're a fool. You know, they'll come arrest you, and they should. 
Amen. But in your home. Oh, now, now, brother and sister, we got something to say about that. Parents, if your teenager wants to live in your house, eat your food, sleep in the bed that you provided and bought for them, and partake of the air conditioning and the roof over their head, but they want to go out and they want to do their thing and fellowship with their evil friends and lay around with their boyfriend and so forth, and you're letting them do that, then you're a partner to the crime. Now listen, I know there are parents that don't have any that don't have any proper relationship with their children. They're all rules and all law and no love. And that's why the kids are doing that. Well, see, there's two sides to what I'm preaching. And kids that grow up with all rules and laws and all that, whenever the time comes they can do something, they're out of there. I'm not just talking, you realize there's two sides to what I'm preaching. And I don't blame them for being out of there. There needs to be a whole lot of love. But that, that there's sometimes where you say love is not going to bring that into this house. Out of love for you, you're not, you're not bringing that in my house. I've protected you all these years from all these wrong influences. Now, you're not going to bring that into my house and expose me to that. It's not going to happen here. Because why? Because that par those parents have authority in that house. Well, this is, this, is, this is our house here. This Spirit of Faith Family Church is our house. And we have some authority in what is allowed in here. Am I making any sense? Well, praise the Lord. The laws, of love and the, the laws of love and the laws of fellowship do not contradict one another. What I'm preaching this morning is love for this local church, for people who want to fellowship. The only place in the city all week long they can come and fellowship with the presence of God and not have a bunch of perversion and stuff around them. You know what I'm talking about? And uh, they want that place because that, that it's clean. They want, they want a place like that because it's clean. Amen. And so that we protect this church from fellowship with that kind with wrong things. Also, go over to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. Oh my goodness. Is it already 11 or, or, or uh, 12 o'clock? My goodness. Let's look at this one one further. I saw this morning in my heart this was going to be two services, so I guess I'm not surprised. <laughs> but 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. Notice verse number 16. In the King James, know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. The King James says, uh, I mean, I just quoted the King James there, but it Amplified says, Do ye not discern and understand that you, the whole church at Corinth, or, this is written thus, the whole church at Cedar Rapids, or Spirit of Faith Family Church, we're not... We're not the whole church at Cedar Rapids, but we're part of the church at Cedar Rapids. You, the whole church at Cedar Rapids, are God's temple, His sanctuary, and that God's Spirit has His permanent dwelling in you to be at home in you collectively as a church and also individually. Then verse 17 goes on in the King James and says, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Whoa! So, God is big in not defiling the local church. If anything defiles the local church, God said He wants to that destroyed. Now, the people can choose whether they're going to get destroyed along with it or not, but whether they hold on to it or they let go of it. God's not trying to destroy people, but He's going to get rid of the defilement. And if they want to hold on to it, then they'll be turned over to the destruction of their flesh. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Ephesians 2.21. Ephesians 2.21 in the Amplified says, in Him the whole structure, talking about the local church, is joined, bound, and welded together harmoniously, and, in and it continues to rise, grow, and increase. Now notice again here it says the same thing. Into a holy temple in the Lord, a sanctuary dedicated, consecrated, and sacred to the presence of the Lord. 
Oh, to the presence of who? Not evil spirits. This is not a place for evil spirits. This is not a place for defilement. I want you to notice there, he, both in, in 1 Corinthians 3 and in Ephesians 2, both of those verses we read, Ephesians 2, 21, in the Amplified, he says it's God's temple, and then the Amplified adds his sanctuary. Sanctuary. Now, that's a term both Old and New Testament used in the King James as well as this translation. But a sanctuary is a place that is, that is set aside, that is, that is uh, set aside, sanctified, set aside to the presence and worship of God. Amen. And it shares in God's purity, and it shares in abstaining from earthly defilement just like God. That's a Greek help that I looked up, said that's what a sanctuary is. It shares in purity like God. It's set aside. It's a place of purity, not defilement. The word sanctuary and the word holy are taken from uh, similar words in the Greek, and anything that is a sanctuary is holy. It's set aside. It's dedicated to uh, the holy presence of God. Do you understand what he's talking about now? So a local church, he's saying, is a sanctuary. A holy place set aside from the profane things of the world for a habitation of God's presence. It's to be the one place where God's people can come and not have fellowships with the spirits of the world. Do you want to sit here and have to try to praise God when a perverted person is sitting beside you? A man who wants to look like a lady, but he's a man. Huh? I don't either. And so we don't allow that in here. Amen. I don't want to have to deal with that when I come to church. Now, let me, let me clarify something. Somebody said, does that mean they're not welcome here? If they want to live for God and they want to get right with God, they're welcome here. If they have a humble heart, a repentant heart. But listen, some of them don't want to have a humble heart. They, 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 they don't want to have, they want to live the way they want to live in their perversion, and then they want to come into a place like this, and they want to deper, pervert what is clean. And that God didn't send them, the devil sent them. The devil sends people to church too. And he sends them to pervert that house so that it shuts down the power of God, and there's no longer a habitation of God in the Spirit in that city. Now, there's no place where the Spirit of God can flow freely in that city. Are you all still out there? Are you still, still glad you came? Anything that is allowed in a local church that grieves the Spirit of God is working against God's plan for that local church. Amen. Jesus drove these things out. He said, did you hear what he said back there where we started? The zeal... The fervor of love for your house has eaten me up. I will be consumed with jealousy for the honor of my house. Or honor of, of your house, he said. We're talking about God's house. Now, can you see all those things coming together? The jealousy factor? Can you see, he said, I'm consumed with the uh, zeal. Notice the way the Amplified says it. The fervor of love for your house. And he said, that zeal eats me up. He said, it consumes me. Amen. It will, I will be consumed with jealousy, notice, for the honor, listen, the honor of your house. There's a lot of words in here. Jealousy, consumed, zealous, honor. Amen. Amen. And this zeal that things be right and things be clean eats me up. In other words, it consumes me. Now, this zeal has consumed me. Amen. I remember in a church we were preaching, Pastor Debbie and I were churching, uh, preaching in a church in, uh, I believe it was North Dakota. We uh, were invited guests there. And uh, the first service, the first series of meetings, I don't remember if it was the first night of the first 
time we were there, but first series of meetings. Pastor Debbie, we were walking in, and she uh, she leaned over. We got to the front row. We're guest speakers. They're doing praise and worship. We got to the front row. We got to our place, and she leaned over, and she said, there's a woman here with an unclean spirit on her. See, we watch out for one another. <laughs> Amen. So I said, okay, thank you. <clears throat> And I knew we had already agreed this. We, there's certain things we watch out for, and here's what we do if this happens. Because sometimes they'll come up to you, and they'll want to get real close. That, that, you know, come up to me and get real close and get in your space, you know. And Pastor Debbie knows exactly what to do. She comes up, she comes up, and, and, and inserts her foot between us and stands right there. So we, we, we both knew why what that meant when she said that, what was going to happen if this happened and all. We, we, we got our plan, see? Some of you don't have a plan when evil shows up, and that's why you fall. You got to have a plan. Got to have a plan. Have a plan. So anyway, I said, okay, thank you. Well, uh, within a service or two, I don't remember if it was the same service, uh, I called for a healing line, ministered to the sick, and the piano's on this side of the auditorium. I started the healing line over here or whichever way it was, vice versa, whatever. And, and on the opposite side where the piano was, uh, 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 there were some people standing, and uh, people of the opposite sex came up behind them and real su seductively rubbing this person's back. And it was very seductive. You know what I mean? How many of you know, number one, you shouldn't be rubbing the opposite sex back anyway unless they're your spouse. And maybe that ought to stay out of the building too. But anyway. Uh, not, you know, I'm, I'm not being legal, legal, legalistic about it, but you know what I'm talking about. There's a place for that. There's a time for that. <laughs> anyway, moving right on. But she saw it, and I didn't because I'm at the other end of the line. And she's playing to back me up, and she stopped her playing, and she had a microphone, and she said, men with men and women with women. I'm like, what's going on? I mean... You're supposed to be backing me up. You stop playing. You know, what happened? Well, when I found out later what, I, what she saw, I understood. Well, um, that night or with, within, I don't remember the nights of when it all happened, but, but in that series of meetings anyway, she had a dream that first, that first time we were there. And in the dream, she saw herself telling the pastor and his wife, that, uh, that this woman had an unclean spirit. She didn't want to be right. You realize there's people that want to be right. And, you know, we allow those individuals to stay here until they get it because God needs, God needs people need to have a place they can come and get washed with the water of the Word. And so if people want to be right, that's, that's a totally different ballgame than what I'm talking about. So, uh, but we'll allow people that, that want to get right, even if they stumble, get back up. Uh, there are people here that can testify. We've worked with people for years sometimes. Keep coming. Just keep coming. We, we tell them, keep coming. Keep coming. Amen. Because they want to be right. They want to be right. So, and then they, they get enough word in them. Finally, they start walking right most of the time, you know. Sometimes not, but most of the time. But so anyway, uh, she had this dream and saw this, saw this, she saw herself telling this pastor and his wife, to, uh, that this lady didn't want to be right, and she was sent to open the door to the devil to get something in the church that doesn't belong in the church. And uh, that, that the Lord tells me to tell you she needs to be removed from the church. But you're the pastors. I can't do it. You have to do it. So she told me about the dream. I said, well, you got to obey God. So she told him that. Oh, the pastor and both his wife said, we're, we're mercy gifts. We, we, we have mercy. We want to see people... Uh, you know, get, get, have an opportunity to get right with God. We said, well, we do too. We understand mercy. But it's when the Spirit of God reveals that they don't want to live right. That's a different thing. And so uh, we said, uh, oh, my goodness. F folks, I had no idea it was so late. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close whenever the Spirit of God releases me here. <laughs> okay, got out of that one. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> And so, but uh, that was, you know, we finished the meeting, we left. They invited us to come back the next year, so we came back the next year. And uh, the next year, there was a couple of more people in the, in the, in the church with unclean spirits. And uh, it was worse. Pastor Debbie had the same dream the second time. Told the pastors what she saw again, same, same, same exact dream. And said, this is not, the, it's not that we don't have mercy. It's that the Lord is saying they are sent here to shut this church down. 
This is a sanctuary. This is a holy place. They're here to, they're here to defile the holy place. And so, well, they said again, but we're mercy gifts, and we want to see. We said, we understand that, but the Spirit of God has manifested Himself. And we got, we got a little bit, not, not as straight as I just said it, but we got pretty straight when the Spirit of God has manifested Himself. So, um, and so that's why I'm doing this, because I've gotten released by the Spirit on some things I've been sitting on for a couple of months. I said, Lord, I'm not going to do it without your anointing. So, and just, just this week, the anointing came on me before. I said, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. Amen. So uh, we said, well, we understand mercy, but, but uh, we're trying to tell you the Spirit of God has spoken to us. And you can either receive that or not receive it. They said, well, we're, you know, they didn't do anything about it. They invited us to come back the third year. And the third year, there was about seven or eight or so different people in the congregation uh, uh, full of this unclean spirit. And no move of the spirit anymore. The church, the church had actually shrunk in size. In fact, every year we went, it was smaller. The number of real sheep was getting less and less, and the number of people in, with a perverted spirit is growing. They're having church growth, except it's not a church growth. They're having perverted growth. Colossians talks about the in, increasing with the increase of God, not the increase of carnality or perversion but the increase of God. Well, the third time, whenever the church was smaller, very, I don't think there was 25 people in the whole, in the whole, you know, the whole time we were there, maybe, maybe 30 people or so, and seven to eight of those are unclean, people with unclean spirits on them. Do you think we want to go back? No. They invited us back, and we said, no, we're not coming back. Somebody said, what happened? It was only a year or so, and that church completely closed down, and uh, the doors were shut, and uh, the church closed up. Why? Because God removed that candlestick out of that city. Amen. Well, that's just not right. I don't think that's right preaching. Well, then you got trouble with Jesus in the book of Revelation. He said, deal with these things in your church or I'll remove your candlestick. Amen. So a church is a fellowship. Number one. Number two, a church is a sanctuary. Isn't that right? It's a holy place set aside from, uh, for, for the worship of God, set aside for God's holy manifest presence, set aside from profane things of the world as a habitation of God through the Spirit. Anything that's allowed in that church that grieves the Spirit is working against that sanctuary. Amen? Anything. Praise God. So, the word sanctuary is also in the dictionary, in the Greek dictionary. A place sacred to God which are not to be profaned. Places sacred to God which are not to be profaned. So the church is a sanctuary. In other words, it's holy. The Bible said so. Amen. Hallelujah. But see, holy, the holiness of God is to be reverenced. The word reverence means to revere. We're to revere the manifest presence of God. Amen. It's our response to God's presence. And part of that reverence is not bring anything in that would defile, anything unholy that would be grievous to the holy God we worship. Amen. I know of uh, husbands or wives that came and wanted counseling because their spouse wanted to bring something unholy into their sex life. Well, the bed in the marriage union is not defiled. But there are defiled things out there in the world that are unholy. And I just, they, they come and they want to talk to us. I, they, I, you know, it's just, it's just, I don't like it. It's just unclean. There's something about it that's getting unclean. Don't like it. Amen. Same thing's what he's talking about here. Amen. Amen. So a, whole, a church is a fellowship. A fellowship of the Spirit. One Spirit. Not a bunch of spirits. Number two, it's a sanctuary. Number three, it's a place where people agree. They agree. They're like-minded and in unity of the Spirit. Philippians 2, 1 through 2 says so. Philippians 2 talks about it. Ephesians 4, 3 talks about it. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. We agree on the unity of the Spirit. We agree that we all love holiness and the holy presence of God. 
That's what we want here. We don't want unclean things here. Amen. We agree we're not going to bring anything into this local congregation, this company that is in disagreement with the Spirit or that grieves the Spirit in such a way that he no longer wants this to be, he no longer wants to habitate here. Now, individually, he lives on the inside of us, but he corporately wants to inhabit us corporately, <coughs> and that can be lost. The corporate anointing can be lost. <clears throat> Amen. And we have to agree, if you're a part of this local church, you agree, I'm not going to just try to live any old way I want and be living pervertedly and have fellowship with unclean spirits and then come into this place. This is a place of holiness. And you are by, by, by saying, this is my home church, this is where I want to fellowship, and I want to show up here every Sunday, you're agreeing to say, I'm not bringing anything in here that will grieve the Spirit of God, that will defile the sanctuary. I'll say it again. I'm not talking about people that have stumbled and didn't want to live that way and want to get right. They, want to, they, want to, they don't want to live that way. You understand? I'm talking about people who just don't really care anymore. The strategy in the past, in the past, most of these people didn't hang around. But now some people, they want to keep hanging around. And I've left it. I, I waited on the Spirit to say anything about it. And this week, the Lord dealt with me. Oh, you're released now to say something about it. And I'm saying, you, we, you are welcome here if you want to live right. You're welcome here if you want to repent. And I don't just mean repent in private, because I know what you're doing. Come to me and repent. Homosexual relationships and sleeping with your boyfriend. Come to me, or else we're going to have to deal with it, because nothing in this church is going to defile this congregation. I don't think I have to make myself any more clear. I think you understand. Amen. The zeal of his house has eaten me up. The honor, notice he said, I am consumed with jealousy for the honor of your house. The honor of God's house is the, is the uh, honor of God on a local church. I want the honor of God here. But also the honor of men who are not saved that they need to still honor the local church and not say, see, they all live the way we live. They're a bunch of hypocrites. That honor will not be lost in this city where men no longer honor this presence that we have here and they think that's just a bunch of, it's just a bunch of made up stuff. No, this city will honor the miracles that happen here. They will honor that there's a holy place in town. Amen. We don't want to lose our testimony. If men don't honor the house of God or this sanctuary is holy, then we've done something wrong. The Bible says in the book of Acts, no man dare join himself to them unless they really got saved. And they were really living like that. They were afraid in the book of Acts. The reason was because Ananias and Sapphira just fell dead. This city needs to know there's a holy place. It's not defiled, not unclean. Even if, if sinners want to get right, they can go there and be made holy. Thank God they can be made holy. Be washed in the blood. Be purged and cleansed. And I want, I want to rightly divide what I'm teaching. I want people to know that they're welcome here if they want to get right with God and they want to come. Even if they keep tripping up and keep falling, you're welcome here. Keep coming. Get the Word in you. Get strong enough to, to spiritually be able to stand against the temptations of the enemy. We got to rightly divide this. I'm not, I'm not talking about those people who are not welcome. We need, to be, we need to be right towards the sinner with the message of they're welcome here. But people that they don't care, they just want to just, have, just, just come here and get the benefits of a local church, but they don't want to go on continuing to walk in the light. Now nah, that's going to be a, a problem. And I'll be honest with you, baby Christians, I'm not near as going to deal with them near as strongly as people who have been here a long time and they know better. I don't really expect a whole lot out of baby Christians. You don't expect that a lot out of your baby if you have a baby in your family. If, if the day after they're, they're, they're born or even two years after they're born, if they're not feeding themselves, going to the refrigerator, making sandwich for themselves, and, you know, taking, you don't think something's wrong. 
Same with spiritual babies. So we want to rightly divide this. Do you all hear the way we're dividing this? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The zeal of his house has eaten me up. The way the Lord put it in my heart is all other zeals get eaten up by this one. Uh, All other zeals, excuse me. Desires, I meant to say desires. All other desires and zeals are absorbed into this one. That desire for that pastor and his wife to be merciful up in North Dakota should have been eaten up by the desire that uncleanness will not get in here. They would still have a church today. Amen. You have to, as a leader, you have to know by the Spirit when to be merciful and how far to go and when to say, now that's it. And this morning I'm saying to some folks, whether they're here or on live stream, that's, this is it. No more sleeping with your boyfriend and just living in open sin and calling yourself married and when you're not married. Nowhere in the history of the world was a, was a couple married if the community didn't know about it. Either the church, like we're in a local church, either the state or the, or the uh, you know, the, the, the tribe, if it was a tribe back in the bush. You weren't married unless they, the, the whole company knew about it. So just because you're sleeping together doesn't mean you're married. Amen. And you're not authorized to change the scriptures just because of your new doctrine because you're married now. Amen. Romans 12, 9 and 10. Abhor that which, evil, that which is evil. Be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. I've waited on the Spirit about this to show me how and when to address this, and so now I'm doing it by the Spirit. Amen. I told the Lord, Lord, there'd be a better time. I don't know how many I'm going to be here this morning with, with this weather, you know. And I tried to get another sermon, and he said, they're responsible. They're responsible. So I shared it. Amen. I don't, I don't want you to think I'm mad. I'm just zealous for the purity of God's house. Amen. Hallelujah. God gives people space to repent. And that's what I've been waiting on a couple of months. Now, these people have been talked to in private. So it's not like they don't know. Amen. Hallelujah. I will not allow this congregation to begin to fill up with unclean spirits. Hallelujah. There in 1 Corinthians 3, he said, The temple of God is holy. If any man defile the temple of God, him will God destroy. The temple of God is holy. Which temple you are? If God is destroying them and turning them over to the destruction of their flesh, for removal of them from the fellowship of the body, why must I protect them? Amen. These people are to be removed. Amen. Hallelujah. Some perverted groups, and I'm done, just finishing the last couple of points. Some perverted groups are so used to hearing about their rights in our culture so accustomed to hear talk about their rights that they now think they have rights to stay in fellowship with a local church living in perversion but that right does not extend to the local church sanctuary amen amen praise the Lord Satan wants to pervert the sanctuary, and we are zealous to keep it clean. Hallelujah. I have a natural tendency in my natural man, which does not dominate me when the Spirit of God deals with me to do something, but uh, to not confront these things. But uh, the Lord said this morning, now you have to do it. Amen? We're not opening the door to the devil here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Write down Deuteronomy 4.24, and you'll find there that God demands to be alone in fellowship. Deuteronomy 4.24. But uh, there's there's, uh, one individual that I have already turned over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh, and it's already begun to work. The other one, the Lord said, no, you can't do it yet. They're too young. Amen. But we're not going to allow it in this church. Someone said, well, I'll prove it. I'll prove it that the devil can't get me. Oh, how's it working out for you? Amen. 
Praise the Lord. Everybody say, I still love Jesus, and I still love Pastor. Still love Jesus, and I still love Pastor. Amen. Well, I'm uncomfortable this morning. Good. <laughs> Wonderful. Good. I'm so glad. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's the way you ought to feel in the presence of a holy God. <laughs> Hallelujah. I said, isn't God good? Something's wrong with the church where you feel comfortable living in your sin. Amen. Where the Holy Spirit moves, there's conviction of sin. Hallelujah. I have a desire that, that we grow numerically. God has that desire for spirit of faith, that it grows numerically. But not at the expense of defiling the sanctuary. Amen. Not at the expense of unclean things being allowed to, 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 to just prevail whenever, whenever somebody doesn't want to live right. Do you understand? Once again, I'm going to say there's a difference between someone who just keeps falling, but they want to live right. Totally different thing. Amen? How many of you know God looks on people's hearts in these things? Some people's hearts are right, but they're, they just keep falling to the flesh. That's a different deal. I'm glad God was merciful with me in those kinds of situations. Anyone? But sometimes people's hearts are wrong. They might even be doing all the right things, but their hearts are wrong. God says, I don't accept that. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet.